the BATCE Six Form for this morning. And it's really an honor to have you here with us this morning. And I know, same thing, I know your time is valuable. So I just want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with our students this morning. This is really an invaluable opportunity for them. So I thank you very much. And I now pass you back to Mr. Pollard. Okay. So as I said before, thanks, um, Ms. Yanafu. So as I said before, I would not do much talking. How we design this is that the students take the charge. They act as the moderator for the event. Um, they have the questions lined up and we try to be as concise as, as, um, as possible. Now, before Ms. Thomas, who is the moderator, take over, I don't know if, um, Minister, if you have anything to say before we start. Well, firstly, let me thank you for inviting me to be a part of this session. I think that um, it's a very good initiative that the teachers have taken the time out to uh, seek this type of uh, forum for the students to engage and have uh, interaction with leaders outside of your teachers and your principals so they can get a different view, especially at the level of um, as a minister, as a young person who would have done physical education at school, I'm happy to see PE get to the level of being taught at sixth form. That is something that must be commended that there are actually people, young people involved in taking PE at the sixth form level who didn't have that in, in our days. I want to commend you on um, focusing on women in sport because we have been battling. We're trying to get parity for quite some years, for decades, and we are still fighting uh, today as we speak. So it's, there are lots of stories to share. It's an interesting position to be in as a woman, as a young woman, as a minister of sport. So I look forward to hearing the contributions, the questions from the students, and I'm very excited to share uh, with you today. Okay, great. So, Ms. Thomas, over to you. Again, good morning. Um, good morning. I'll start with the first question. So, how has your ministry addressed gender inequality in sport? Okay, um, I assumed duties in the Ministry of Sport in 2018. So I'm um, about two years old in, the, in this new uh, position as a woman in sport, as a woman. And I still like to call myself a woman in sport. Um, I think that it is important that we place tremendous focus on women and girls in sport. Because if we are going to focus or, or have any interest in women in sport at all, we must pay significant attention to girls in sport. So uh, we have been working with national governing bodies to ensure that they have programs that cater to uh, young women and, and girls also. Sport in schools is under the remit of the Ministry of Education, but we extend support for community activity and for activities specifically that uh, speak to getting girls more involved. Total participation in sport is an important pillar of the national sport policy 2017 to 2027 and uh, total participation speaks to people of all ages, all backgrounds, um, all types of abilities and competencies that they get involved in sport. Uh, there has been a worldwide struggle uh, as it relates to promoting women in sport. So we are in Trinidad and Tobago, we work with the TTOC, the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. They have a future is female program and we've developed within the ministry, the Pink Rain campaign. Uh, Pink Rain campaign pink being the color for that is mostly affiliated with girls. Rain, R-E-I-G-N, that means uh, glory, leadership, uh, just celebrating women in sport. So it's called the Pink Rain Campaign and it is based on promoting women and girls in sport. And we chose girls from the age of seven because oftentimes in uh, primary school and in nursery school, you have some type of physical activity taking place. But as women, as girls approach puberty, they tend to fall off. Um, 
you're going to have your period so uh, some parents it, it becomes uncomfortable for you as a girl and uh, it's uncomfortable for the parents also that you're about to enter um, adulthood by simply having a period and all the different uh, stigmas and teachings that our parents would have taught us we know as a people we have to change the culture as it relates to um, women in sport even as the ministry of sport we have to ensure that the facilities are conducive or welcoming for girls to be able to go to change to shower to be able to change your sanitary pads or your tampons or or whatever to teach young women that it is okay to balance sport and academics in our culture our parents tend to say uh sport is for men because it has traditionally been that way and academics is for women so my brothers were encouraged to go outside and play while the girls were asked to come inside and study. We have a very uh, troubling mindset in Trinidad and Tobago where it's a part of the culture and uh, we push men in sport and we don't push women. And the, the worst part is at the school level, uh, children who don't participate well in academics, we push them towards sport and we make people feel that if you're participating in sport then you cannot in in academics and we don't we we make the child choose rather than create opportunities for the student athlete to catch up for them to see um athletics as a, a means of income generation as a career opportunity we we or, or, or culture forces the student athlete or forces us to, as parents to have to choose so an important part of the pink green campaign is to change the culture it's not just about seeing a cleopatra borel or Timmy Campbell, or you know, any of these people excel. Yes, we want to see that. But from that very early stage in the schools and in your homes, we want to say that a student athlete is a better student because there are characteristics that you can learn from sport that you cannot learn anywhere else, or it would be difficult for you to learn anywhere else team spirit, building proper friendships and networks through sport, getting the opportunity to, have, to get a scholarship, seeing sport as a means of income generation. We have to promote the good. And those opportunities are equally important to girls and our daughters as they are to our sons. Yes, so for me, the Pink Green campaign is a, a, a critical part of our work agenda and our development program in the ministry. And it's not just about highlighting a female athlete or celebrating the female athlete who would have excelled, but the core of this project is to change the culture and uh, uh, letting women know also that your participation in sport doesn't have to mean going out there and getting sweaty. Because you may not be at the age where you want to do that, or you may bring something different to sport. I remember when I started, when I assumed duties as Minister of Sport, and TV6 and a couple other uh, media houses came, came with me on my first day. And they asked me, um, well, you're not an athlete. How could you be Minister of Sport? And I said, sport is not my forte. Youth development is, because it was the Ministry of Sport and you. Uh, however, as minister, my business is to lead, to facilitate, to help the sporting entities. And it became a big joke across Trinidad and Tobago because the minister had said that sport isn't her forte. And they said, oh, well, she can't play sport. She can't do it, anything. But in my two years, it has been such an important uh, journey for me and an inspiring journey for me because I do so much of part in fact in sport in sport 
by simply sitting and solving problems among the NGBs. My business is to ensure that they get the necessary uh, resources, make sure infrastructure is kept up to standard, that they get their monies to go out there and, um, and participate, that they have structure, that they have order. And that's important because sport is not just about going out there and play. There is science in sport. There is the business of sport. To me, sport is a business more than anything else. Yes, it's good for physical fitness and all these wonderful things to keep you, you healthy mentally and physically and all that. But the business of sport, if we don't mind the business of sport properly, then sport is better off just seen as recreation. So leadership, management, even reporting and journalism, sport writing, maintaining Facebook pages and, and Instagram and so on. We need women. We need people, young people, even at your age in school. Why can't you be a social media officer for a sporting group? Half of them don't keep their books properly. Their accounting is in a mess. They, um, even how they have meetings, their constitution needs to be up dated they don't have a proper social media presence and in this day and age if you don't have internet or social media presence you sort of don't even exist in the business world you know so there's room so much room for women in sport at all levels from playing to um volunteering to helping in the accounting and the book management the administration to management itself coaching you name it, reporting, broadcasting. Uh, we have a role to play and oftentimes we blame men and the whole nature of sport being a male dominated uh, type of uh, arena. But we as women also make it difficult for ourselves because of our culture and how we see ourselves and how we see other women. And by those of us who are women in sport, not making opportunities for other women in sport. If you're a woman in sport and you made it to the boardroom, you made it to be a director, then you have to make room for other women. You have a duty to do that because then when you're at the level of leadership in sport as a woman, you're not forced to think. You have to think about things that the men didn't think about, like, do we have a rental kill container in the, in the dressing room? Do we have a place for ladies to shower? What about maternal leave benefits for the uh, female athlete? Is there a program to allow the female athlete to gradually get back into the game after she has ha taken a break to have a baby? You know, those type of things. And just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you want to have a baby. Yes, so that breaking away at puberty or that leaving sport when you turn 18, 19 to go focus on the family, it may not be for everyone. So there are some people who may want to go up to being 25, 30, and then have children after that, whatever you decide. But we must be granted equal opportunities as men. And I know I would have segued a lot on your question, what is your ministry doing about women in sport? We support NGVs, we support, like if you're a community group and you're running a, uh, a program specifically for girls we are going to be the first to jump on board to provide assistance financial assistance and so on uh, but as I said before and why I would have segued like that our problem the bulk of our problem lies in the culture in how we think in how we train girls in how we as parents and teachers uh, conduct our business and how we see sport and totally maximizing the potential of sport to create a better life for young people. And that's really where my uh, focus is in the ministry and uh, as a woman, or may I dare say even as a feminist, yeah? So we have some work to do as it relates to the development of women in sport and through sport. I know that was a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what has been the main challenges as your minister for two years? What has been the main challenges, um, whether it's been funding or lack of role models? Oh, um, overall, the challenge in sport would be funding because uh, we're in government at a time when 
we're facing tremendous financial difficulty as it relates to the dip in our income, uh, lower oil prices, lower gas prices, and the income that we receive now as a government that we generate now is just not as much as we would have some 10, 15 years ago. So all ministries have to deal with a smaller budget. Another, so you have 54 sporting disciplines under my watch from ballroom dancing and checkers and card playing to football and cricket and canoeing and all these things. And we have to treat we have to treat them all with respect. As much as football and cricket think that they are the big bad football and cricket, I have to give uh, that type of tender loving care and attention to Scrabble, to checkers, to that. So um, I think that uh, that has been a challenge, and that had been new to many of the sporting organizations too, because they had been accustomed to being treated as you give all this attention to football and cricket and netball and so on. But we have a host of other sporting, uh, and I, I, I try to treat with it from a level of uh, not just equality, but of equity also to ensure that whatever sport that you decide to participate in, that you are given the opportunity to participate in regional competitions and international competitions. And I try to place tremendous focus on the sporting disciplines that are doing, actually doing work in the communities and doing work in school. So the shift in direction and attention have been a little difficult for some of the sporting disciplines. The fact that we don't have enough money to send everybody to all the games that they want to go to. Accountability is another issue on the part of the NGBs because they have to submit their sporting groups, they have to submit their audited financials in time. Time. They have to submit their paperwork, their budgeting, and so on, on time. And uh, many of them haven't mastered that just yet, or haven't been satisfactory. You have sporting entities submitting their requests two weeks before the games. That's not, it's not possible. It's not right to then have to rush the, the staff at the ministry to go find money for you because you were late or for me to push aside a sporting entity that would have turned in their documents since the beginning of the fiscal year to facilitate you because you are going to your international games and you've submitted two weeks before so there's always a clashing of heads there's always some back and out in sport always because uh, different leaders have different perspectives they do things differently and um, every sporting discipline has its own little bit of confusion. So I do more of trying to maintain peace than anything else. Um, another challenge would, would be uh, for sport. We have these sporting facilities. We've worked over the years to build those sporting facilities. You have the major ones like the Hasty Crawford Stadium, the Jane Bear Complex. And over the years, the maintenance have been poor, very poor. Uh, many of them are at a state that they really need to be ripped down and built back up again, but we cannot afford to do that as a country. So we go in and we fix uh, peace, peace because of our economic situation. But even as we do that, sporting bodies don't want to pay to use these facilities. So they want it to be kept up to standard. They don't want to pay a little fee. They, they write hundreds of letters each year asking for pardon, we grant them pardon. They don't want to pay the little fees. Uh, they want the place to be fully maintained. And they, many of them don't participate in the maintenance. So you have to contract service providers to upkeep these uh, facilities. So everybody say, I want a playing field and I want a multi-purpose facility and so on. It costs a lot of money to run it. The electricity, the utilities, uh, the maintenance of the field and so on. So then when you show up and you don't want to pay the minimum fee, we we're already at a place where hardly anybody pays minimum fee. And the government is expected to continue to keep up um, maintaining and keep them in top class 
it's, it's difficult. That path is really, really, really difficult. We are now um, looking at public pa private partnership as it relates to the maintenance of that, uh, the maintenance of our facilities. But that in itself could even turn out to be a challenge for the people because if I bring in a Dasani Waters or a Coca Cola or even a local entity to part to do a public private partnership, they're not letting you use it for free. They're not. You go to um, these centers in the US, I used to go to watch basketball games and so on while I was studying, and you have to pay. You have to pay to utilize it. You have to pay to go watch a match and so on, things that we are not accustomed to. So uh, we want top class facilities, but we don't want to take care of the facilities. We don't want to pay the little fees. So that in itself is a challenge. You look at Haysby Crawford Stadium, for instance, needs tremendous upgrading. But as we go in to try to upgrade, you have to rip up the, the ground to fix the... Um, this, the, the sewer system and the water and that because many of the facility the, the public utility lines are run on the underground and the athletes are saying no we are getting prepared for olympics you can't go up and uh, dig up that place right now you have to wait whilst another group is saying calling the radio and complaining. So there's always a, uh, some friction. Quite recently, you heard people complaining about Larry Gomes Stadium, which needs lights. But you told us with the little bit of money we had last year to focus on fixing the toilet and so on at uh, Haiti Crawford Stadium. And then we, ran, we, we, won the, um, we won the bid to host the 2023, uh, the 2021 Olympics, no, sorry, Commonwealth Youth Games, which was now moved to 2023 due to the whole COVID situation. So we started to place focus on at a hold on facility. So keeping facilities up to date, um, and functional, the, the cost is exorbitant. Uh, so that is as it relates to overall sport, getting groups organized, the money to take care of facilities, uh, uh, dealing with a smaller budget. Another challenge is getting groups to do what they are supposed to, because NGBs have a responsibility, not just to the government, but also to their parent bodies to have a uh, activities and programs within communities to ensure that you can you, you welcome new talent and that you give back to the community and two and two to ensure that you maintain having women in sport so keeping them um compliant with that is important and the challenge is many of these groups don't necessarily depend on the government for funding they are independent and autonomous. They have their own authority. Uh, they don't have to talk to the Ministry of Sport if they don't want to. Like I remember when I first started in my job, my assumed duties as Minister of Sport, there was somebody who said, we don't have to talk to you. We get our monies from our parent bodies, so we don't feel the need to talk to the Ministry of Sport until they run into some trouble. I had that experience with football. If football really doesn't see the need, the TTFA doesn't really see the need to interact. Uh, matter of fact, I was the one to call TTFA in when they had a challenge. They had the female footballers out in, I think it was Miami, and they were getting ready for some games and the girls were making social media videos saying that they're being treated unfairly, they're not getting the same level of respect as the men in the sport, and they, they need bananas, they need water. It was horrible, it was embarrassing. So I called TTFA in and they said, we depend on FIFA for money. We don't really have to interact with you. You know, that was the posture. So until you get in some trouble, then you're calling for the minister. Well, tell me. Okay. So, but you, you, you have to step in and do what you can to try to save the sport for the future of the young people. Uh, so it's like you have control because you're the ministry of sport, but you don't really have uh, much control so really you cannot intervene in their business if they're having problems in management and they're accounting and so on the most i can say is okay i see you're going down a route where we can no longer give you uh taxpayers dollars but if you have a crooked person and you keep on voting in that crooked person or you continue to vote in um, a type questionable leadership in your organization 
I can't tell the sporting groups who to vote for president, you know? So that limits my ability to influence and I'm not supposed to. So drawing the lines as to what are my roles and my responsibility as minister, a lot of it is very limited. I can't go and tell a group what to do. They have their own constitution. They report to their parent bodies and so on. So you hear people getting on the media and saying, we need a minister spot to intervene and do X, Y, Z. And I know very well that's not my responsibility. That's the responsibility of that sporting body that has its own constitution, that reports to its parent body, and so on. So that is another challenge as it relates to women in sport. One big challenge is women don't see themselves as um, leading. They, they don't want to lead. You have to change that culture, yes? But also we have to create room for women at the upper levels of the entity. And when women get there, they need to perform and they need to make room for other women. And women need to see sport as a means of income generation and don't put down your sporting interests because you're, you're turned 18. That's silly. You know, if you have a plan, you have a goal, you have a dream, chase it relentlessly until you would have achieved your highest level, what you had set out to achieve. And there's room for you, not just on the field, also at the boardroom, also as a, a director of the board, as an administrator in your sporting entity, as a reporter, somebody has to tell the stories. Somebody has to tell the stories. These stories ought to be documented and showcased to inspire other women to get involved in sport. Because if there isn't somebody there fighting on our behalf, we're going to be left behind as women. For instance, when the founder of the Olympics created the modern Olympics or introduced the modern Olympics, he felt like women did not have the biological nature and the capacity to participate at that level. That's troubling. Yes, and it took 80 years, it took 125 years we're trying to achieve equality in the Olympics as women. Then let's look at basketball. When basketball was created, I think it was 1891, it took them 80 years before we can have women's basketball, women in WNBA. So the struggle is very real. And even uh, today, based on our culture, based on even coverage of women in sport, when you look at news, the sport, or oh, well, the sport 15 minutes or whatever they give us. They report, and even when you call them to call reporters to watch a game or to cover a game, the, the men's sports get more coverage and their stories are told and highlighted and celebrated. And, uh, and then, oh, and yeah, in the end, we have one, one lone girl. So we need women all corners minding our business and celebrating our victories because if it's one place to really showcase who women really are and what we are made of is to show that we could compete at the same level of men and we could perform at the same level and even better i remember being around uh, I was in, in 1996, I was a third form student and I was following the, we had the Olympics in that year and that was the year of Michael Jordan and the dream team. And then the US had the women's basketball team and they played hard. I'm talking about guts, I'm talking about strength, grit, you know, and it made women feel empowered like we can do any and everything to watch women in the olympics perform uh like that so look at serena williams play look at other women play kenya yaya Kodna, uh play football abroad you know we have tremendous talent and we can compete at same levels and even better so for me, the biggest challenge for women in sport in Trinidad and Tobago is changing the culture. And that starts with us accepting ourselves as being able to and fighting for uh, leadership. We have very few. We have, we have some. We've been doing better. You have Claire Mitchell, who is heading women's basketball. We have uh, a woman heading, I think it's chess. 
we have a couple women in, in some corners, but I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's enough. And uh, women need to see themselves, well, this is a touchy issue, but as a woman that likes pink nail polish and lipstick and high heels, um, women can be women in sport. You don't have to be butch. You don't have to, you get what I'm saying? You, your business is to be the best you that you can be in any area of your life. So to be a woman in sport, you don't have to be less of a woman to excel in sport. That's another story at another level because I've been to conferences and meetings and I show up and I'm dressed like the woman I am. Be like, well, we're waiting on the sport minister. I am the sport minister. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Because one, people are not accustomed to seeing a woman as the sport minister, a young woman as the sport minister, and you know I'm not showing up in joggers and sneakers. Yeah? So it's important for women to let them hear the clicking of your heels and smell your perfume. And when you speak, they must respect when you speak. So you have a business to not be a token woman at the board boardroom. I mean, here yeah, just because to say we have a woman on the, on the board, you have to know your stuff. You have to know your stuff. You have to do your research. You have to speak up. You have to be ensure that you are respected because you don't just represent yourself. You represent your community. You represent all these women who are counting on you to create a way for them. You know, so it's a very important role to play. You can't allow yourself to be disrespected and you must be mindful of how you carry yourself when you sit among these men who already met at the bar last night and planned the way it's supposed to go. When they try to run around, you call them out. You have to call them out. Yeah. So it's important business and you have to mind your business. Yeah. So um so I, I feel very deeply and strongly about changing the culture more than anything else because we have a way to go and it's so very possible but i don't think that we believe enough or we're willing to run the distance but it's so within reach if we remain uh focused just the same way brian lara is making money in sport and Dwayne bravo is making good money in sport let female cricketers and female runners and fem make money in sport too. You wonder why it isn't happening. But uh, we have to respect ourselves, respect each other. And every time you see a, bar a barrier, point it out, call it out, and be determined to overcome it. Because you're creating a pathway not just for yourself, but for that young woman or for that little girl in your household who you see you know have athletic ability abilities yeah and you want to encourage them and you want to make sure that they don't reach or encounter bar unnecessary barriers that you could have broken down in your time yeah okay i'll thank you um i'd like to extend the floor to the students if they have any questions good morning okay. Ms. good morning um, so you uh, you talk about implementing and being able to have females on the equal level as the male athlete, right? So yes, in theory, mm -hmm. in theory, it is a great idea. But do you have any plans in able to execute that 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 envisionment, or is it all just based oh, yeah. on <laughs> getting them on the same level right now? No, it's not, it's not something done in theory. And it's not something for Sham, for Kodro alone to do. Because I could say these things. And I could also support these things. I can recommend the policy. But it all, but it all up to you at the level of your national governing bodies who represent each sporting discipline in the country. And even you at your little community sport club. Some sporting bodies introduce the lady vice president or lady officer at the level of the ex executive. Now you now have to look into what is she there to do? 
She's not there to look pretty. She's not there to just sit there. What is your agenda within that sporting discipline? Do we want to get more women out on the field? Do we want women to play among men on the field? Right now in primary school football, we allow, I think it's, each team must have one girl on, as a part of the team. We want to get to the place of having a prime, in Tobago we have uh, the girls having their own teams in the primary school. Yes, they play with the boys and now they have their own teams to the point that we can do a primary school football league for girls only at the level of primary school. You trying to introduce that at the level of secondary school, where are you getting the players from? And what level of football you you, you have in a secondary school? If you didn't, you, they would have graduated and sharpened their skills at that level if they would have started at a younger age. So for us, it's encouraging some type of long-term athlete development for the athlete. You go to primary school, you could run. Miss saying you could run, you're participating in the running race. Then you go on to secondary school. And uh, no, you go to primary school, you're playing in the football team. You go on to secondary school, somebody find you could run, then somebody else find you could throw. And you're doing any and everything, and there is no real pathway. So within the school system, there must be a proper pathway. And the Ministry of Education must embrace that. I'm pleased that they have established their own sporting unit. It's for those people to do their job. But I'm speaking about you young people in your sporting groups. Yes. When a woman is elected to being president, you treat her with, you have a duty to treat her with the same respect as you would have treated your male counterpart on your committee as lady vice president on your committee, then what is the agenda? Don't just have her sitting there. What do we hope to accomplish? Is to create an environment to welcome more girls into the sport and not just welcome them, also to have them survive and thrive, to excel within that sport. So you have to set goals as to, we want to see, we want to have a women's league or a girls league. We want to increase women at the level of the, we want to make sure that in every committee that there is a woman. Then what is the agenda? Uh, we need to ensure that our training facilities and ours are conducive to allowing that young woman to go back home, get back home safely. Some girls get thrown out of the thing or have to drop out because the hours we training too late. Training hours are too late or the club doesn't have a proper means of getting the children back home. So that now takes me to um, what do people ask for? What do clubs ask for when they request the assistance of the ministry? How many clubs are asking for um, financial assistance to help in getting female athletes back home at night after training? How many? You know, in your sporting club, um, strategic plan or in how you operate or whatever. How many of you have like a little guidance counselor to, that a student athlete can talk to uh, to help them in balancing their academics and their athletic performance? Or are you just asking for money for a, a little league and for trophy and for jersey and for prizes? your development program has to move beyond that. So this COVID period has forced us to look inward a little deeper because whilst your funding would have been spent on sending people abroad and going to participate in regional and international games, now we have an opportunity to utilize some of that funding to help our sporting groups in succession planning, in uh, sport management, in their administration, and helping them get uh, community, their community um, development agenda running. Yeah, so that's very, very, very important at this point in time. 
and uh, groups really have to regroup and use this period as an opportunity to think and to make a proper contribution to this new normal. Because this new normal is not just about using the internet and Zoom meetings and so on and all. It's about looking at everything that you had an issue or a challenge with within your sporting group or within any area of your life. And it's nobody there to tell you, no, you're doing it wrong. Or, no, you're creating a new normal. So it allows groups the opportunity to sit, to meet, to dig into all the little areas where they had challenges and create a nice, clean, clear platform. Do you know that there are groups who haven't met some sporting groups who haven't met because the members don't know how to use Zoom to participate in a Zoom meeting. And there are some people whose constitution don't even allow them to carry a decision that wasn't done in person, in an in-person meeting. So a Zoom meeting doesn't count. In 2020? Mm -mm. So, those are the kinds of programs that we are running in this fiscal year through the ministry to get these bodies up to par. But they need to see it as important too and participate when we extend those services. We will have start, we started up, uh, we established uh, an e-room so sporting entities can go to Sport TT in Coover and have their e-meetings so that their business can still run. So they have different cameras and all the different uh, pieces of technology that they need there so that they can meet. So um, this creation of the new normal, you, the young people, it's an exciting time for you because you have that background in Facebook and IG and WhatsApp and you grew up with the internet and a lot of your sport administrators and, and managers did not. Now the thing is that you're here not recognizing your own power and you're waiting on some not so young person to create a way forward for you and to point you in a direction and the power is with you. So now is an important time for young people to take themselves seriously. Yes, so I segued on a different direction there, but uh, it's important in sport too. Yes, it's important in sport too. Now, when a, a sporting entity submits a proposal for a sporting event, we are now looking for uh, what type of technology are you implementing to ensure that this match is carried? Do you have a YouTube ch channel? Do you have a social media page? How are you getting your information out to your people? You know, and that's where you guys come in and helping your sporting entities at this time. Yes? Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who have questions? Please, I'll remind everyone to raise their hand. See us. You could go. Um, all right. Hi, good morning. Um, my question was, seeing that um, a lot of people don't know about gender equality and especially in sport, what does the ministry plan to do to educate citizens or students or even players to try to um, implement gender equality in all aspects, especially in sport? Okay. Well, um, we participate in the Futures Female Project with TTOC. Uh, Brian Lewis, who's the president of TTOC, has been leading the charts. We provide the necessary support through, um, through TTOC. And it's not just at the level of the ministry, because each sporting entity, through their sporting bodies, their parent bodies, have a duty to do that. So the Pink Ring campaign allow, allows us to bring all these things in focus. Um, I've been participating in these meetings and these conferences uh, being held by TTOC for the past... Um, for the past three years, yes, and it's all about education. Uh, but you, the players, also have a responsibility to ensure that at every level in your sport that uh, the woman is being considered and her participation is being taken uh, seriously. In Trinidad and Tobago, we like to say, what's the ministry doing? What's the government doing? What's the government? A lot of it, democracy means your hands in the pot everybody's hands in the pot. 
if your hand in the pot and my hand in the pot, who's gonna teach the cookie? If your hand in the jar and my hand in the jar, when I teach the cookie, I watching and you watching. After you place your vote, you have a duty to watch. You have a duty to participate. And I will go in down a different way too. But only if people can understand, acknowledge, appreciate how important you are in the politics, in the decisions that are being made, in what's happening and what's not happening, in what you allow and what you don't allow. That's not just in sport, that's on the whole. The power is with the people and the people need to understand that the power is with the people. So, and any change that the government intend to make, the government cannot do it alone. Yes, you have a duty at, from your very little level of your club. I want to use the TTFA as an example again. You have a couple of people in the TTFA and the executive that took FIFA to court without consulting the TTFA membership, right? We get down to a point of being suspended by FIFA. And it's only when we get down to that point where you're being suspended by FIFA, now you want to have your voices heard, now you're asking for a consultation. That was song, right? How could that be? If you are an active part of the membership, you elected this executive. You're minding your business all the way along. How could they take how could they take FIFA to court without you knowing? And how did you keep your mouth shut for all these months? And only when you recognized the thing getting wet, wet, wet and dire, you decided to have your voice heard. How? Yeah? So you have business in your you need to have a voice and you have business in your business too do you understand what i'm saying if you don't understand tell me if you want me to explain something better tell me but mr pollard i'm sure you understand because i see your face expressions yes so a lot of times sporting buddies sit there and don't say anything until they're in deep 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 trouble and then expect the minister to fix it. You will have um, a specific sport in discipline where their, their leadership is applying to the ministry for money. The ministry is giving the discipline money to go to their different meets and so on. But on the back end, still asking the parents to contribute some crazy um, amounts. How come you've been paying all this money for all these years. And then only when some trouble arises, then you voice your, your concerns. After you've been paying your $10,000 for the past how many ever years, you had to mind your business too. You see, in the past, um, ministry used to give out money to sporting groups and not say anything quietly. But for me, when I give the money, I, get, I do a press release. I try my best to do a press release or to do an event. So that I, and say, I gave X buddy X amount of money. And to some people, it may look like you're showing off. But this is my way of holding them accountable too. Because there are some groups that would sit quietly and act like they didn't get any money from the government. And their membership, no checking but calling and cussing government and cussing and then i i get in the media and say for the past how many other years we've been given such and such athletic body 10 million dollars now you as member need to take them to task i've done my job you need to do yours so in a democracy in anything that you're involved in you have a business to mind your business too and that was stop a lot of things that go wrong right in the truck before it gets too dire and too difficult to resolve. Yeah? Any other questions? Um, I think I saw Dejeuner, your hand was up. You want to go ahead? 
Good morning again to the Minister of Sports, Ms. Shampa Kuju, and everyone else. Um, my question is, do you personally think that in five to ten years from now, there would be an increase in the number of female participants in sport, or will society always view or deem men as the access around which you feel of sports surrounds? I think that we have a way to go. It has been getting better and better, um, especially in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we have some practices and a culture that is very deep rooted, that are very deep rooted, and it's going to take some time. But, excuse me, I think that it keeps getting better. Um, COVID could be seen as a challenge because we were well on our way and you know with our pink green campaign with the future is female and there has been a, a greater level of awareness uh now it all depends on the direction that women intend to take during this pandemic are we going to go back to being home buddies and my business is to take care of the children and or are we going to step up and uh, continue to participate in sport, continue to have our voices heard and, and continue to claim our space at the level of management and leadership. So while we as government can support financially, technically, having the awareness sessions and so on, at the end of the day, it rests with the women themselves to get up and get. Yes, the barriers need to be broken down though, as it relates to um, equal pay, equal benefits, and uh, getting the type of viewership that we want. Yeah, getting more voices heard. There are women who feel ashamed to speak about women issues because you're worried about how the men are looking at you government cannot legislate that we can create programs to encourage you but we can't make you speak up for yourself as women and you as men a lot of it rests with you too in seeing women as your equal in respecting women as your equal in all areas of life Because we are human beings before we are anything else. Anything that hurts you as a man hurts the woman. Anything. Because you are human beings before you are any sex. And if you feel you have the right to X, then the woman has the right to X too. Anything that will hurt you or make you feel discriminated against, make you feel deprived, make you feel lesser, will make the woman feel lesser too. So just as we carry you as women, you have a duty to carry us too. And just like women support the man in leadership, from politics to sports, we support you when you're president of the board. We're happy to be your little secretary and get your notes and support you. When a woman gets there, you have to be happy to support her too because she's not there because she's a woman. She's there because she has the ability, the capabilities, the competence, the skill, the dexterity, the wisdom to lead. You have to respect that. Yeah. Okay. Thank Any more you. Um, so what, what role that sponsorship brands should play in promoting sport, female sport? <laughs> Uh, first, I think firstly in promoting sport, promoting anything, we need private sector to, to, to redouble their efforts. You have groups like NGC, Republic Bank, Digicel also doing very well in supporting athletes. Uh, the female athlete has to also work on her brand and taking herself seriously as an athlete yes 
um, how you market yourself, how you carry yourself, how you present yourself, how you build networks, how you build networks, because much of your progress in this life is also based on your ability to network and who's in your circle. And you having the courage to ask for what you want and to go out there and really chase your dreams. Men, a lot of men get support from a line while they're talking because they're having these conversations. We cannot be afraid or ashamed or too weak to have these conversations. And oftentimes when you're invited to the after line, women are like, no, nah, I'm going home. A lot of the business takes place at the meetup after. When people are relaxed and they're ready to talk and so on. So a part of what we're doing at the level of Sport TT, which is the state enterprise under the Ministry of Sport and Community Development, um, is uh, have these little events where we bring private sector in the same room as athletes and allow athletes to allow them to have that conversation to meet and greet, uh, where we promote sponsorship. The government also had introduced in the last budget, and we would have expanded it in this budget, that's for corporate entities who are making a contribution or supporting athletes up to, I think it's $12 million, they get tax breaks there benefits to encourage them to invest in the athlete it is so for film for the creative arts and for sports that companies to invest who um, provide support they get tax breaks from the government to encourage them yes thank you Mahalia Griffith you had a question Yes, I did. Um, you mentioned the Pink Green campaign. Is that extended to female athletes of the disabled groups special needs? Yes, all our programs extend to uh, special needs athletes and people uh, because that's a major part of our total participation in sport. Even when we build a new facility, uh, we have to follow the codes and so on to ensure that the disabled athlete can access that facility uh, comfortably. So um, all our programs uh, support the disabled or the athletes with different competencies. Uh, we would have seen for special Olympic athletes last year in March, they brought home 52 medals in the Special Olympics and that was our highest medal count. And we would have supported all those athletes going out to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and their parents and their, the, the people who went to assist them. We support them in their different activities to raise funds and so on, so that they can operate throughout the year and not just when there is Olympics or a major event. Yes? So once these groups reach out for funding, we provide the funding and uh, we assist them in whatever they reach out for. So um, that's our duty as government. Um, some groups are more effectively run than others. But at the end of the day, they, they report to their parent bodies, um, whether it's the International Olympic Committee or whatever we as government, we facilitate and we support one interesting thing is the SCOT. The SCOT is being developed right now. And that's where we're going to go from uh, Sport TT to the Sport Commission of Trinidad and Tobago. And it brings them, all the sporting bodies, under one rubric or under one system. And they must follow the rules of the commission uh, in order to get funding, you know. To um, even actually operate, establishing this spot to what Jamaica has uh, going on. Is so that even an, an interesting part of the Scott too, it's dispute resolution um, facility. That if there is confusion or discrepancy, they can go before the dispute resolution body. We are also mm -hmm. working with the TTOC to establish a NADO or National Anti Doping Organization. Uh, so they can treat with dealing with all masses of anti-doping locally 
rather than having to reach out to the Caribbean Rado. So we're working on a number of matters in the ministry and we are learning and growing as we go. Any more questions? Um, yes, yeah, so the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee has a slogan, the future is female. And um, while the attempt to encourage gender equality in sport, do you think that um, it could potentially cause inequality if all the focus and the funding swings to the female sport and yeah. female athletes? It's not all the funding going towards them. We recognize that um, there is a tremendous disparity. Even when you look at the number of females going out to represent Trinidad and Tobago in the Olympics, and we want to increase that. And it's not just a local uh, drive, it's an international drive. Uh, the, from as early under the United Nations through the, uh, I think it's the Brighton, uh, it's a Brighton declaration to promote women in sport. And then we have uh, the same um, initiative being pushed throughout the Commonwealth. It's uh, an issue all over the world to get women more involved. The same way in sport is the same as so for women in government, women in politics. Yes? So um, it's about equality all the way around in sport politics and medicine and research yes so that women can be treated fairly and equally and have equal opportunity to the same things that men enjoy thank you um any more uh, any more questions from the students remember to put your raise your hands Okay, I think that may be it. Yeah. I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Pollard. Okay. Thanks a lot. So thanks a lot, um, Carrie. Um, and thanks to the minister. I think, um, you know, Carrie would have had a lot of questions, but in each answer, the minister would have covered so much that, um, you know, all the questions were covered. And I hope that the students were able to take the notes um, because it is an important topic. It is a topic that, that CAPE, CSEC, um, CAPE A-levels tend to bring gender equality in sport and uh, um i want to from a personal level as a standing minister um because i have been able to see firsthand you know some of the inequalities um being involved in the, the women's volleyball and um some of the struggles that the the girls will go through to get that equality, to get just the, um, the respect that they deserve. And it's not, as I, I keep saying, it's not that, you know, they want more respect, but they want the same respect. And I think that is only fair. All right. Um, so if there are no more questions, um, again, I just want to thank the minister. I want to pass on to Ms. Griff, who will do the vote of thanks. Hi again. So thank, thank you on behalf of the students and the teachers of the ATC Sex Forum. It's very inspiring and I'm sure I could speak for everyone when we, we know this um, session was educating and, inf and informative. So thanks once again to the minister and all the other representatives here today. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak to students and young people or future and current leaders. So um, I encourage you to go out there, chase your dreams, focus at school, uh, just give it your best shot because we are depending on you, especially as we create this new normal, we are depending on you, the young people. So to 
all of you at Trinity College and and that bishops, I want to thank you so, so, so very much for having me. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Okay, students. So that is the end.